Good afternoon. Guys, um, I know everybody in here is a developer and a coder, and we've heard a lot of stuff on everything from PCI compliance to gateways and you know processing, and, and all that's really important, and that's a huge foundation of what our industry is as payment engineers. But um, I'm, I myself, I like history, and I think it's really important to know how we got to where we are today. You know, how do we end up with, you know, the plastic that's in our wallets or the idea of doing a transaction on a mobile phone or just the idea of a credit card vault and tokenization? Um, we are really in the midst of a huge transition from where we're carrying around a wallet and a phone to where we're probably just going to be carrying around a phone. And that's literally happening right now. Um, so this presentation really is not going to get too in-depth on the technology of that, but really the history of how we got there in the first place. So just a quick background on me before we get started. Um, I'm a co-founder and CMO of a company down in Charleston called RadTab. Um, we integrate with the top 16 point-of-sale companies in the U.S., and we use Spreedly as our credit card vault. And there's about 20 other companies um, that are getting into the hospitality payments for bars and restaurants. The big reason why there's a lot of innovation that needs to happen there and part of the reason why is a bar and a restaurant really operates the same way it did 10 years ago most of the pos machines as hardware are really no different than what they were five years ago there's a back of the house pretty much running like a windows 7 terminals that are connected to it they have an edc that's running batch credit card files and then they have a payment processor such as world pay or first data so really to kind of separate ourselves from the competition and, and, and really kind of offer more value to the bars, we said, hey, instead of us actually processing the payment on Stripe or Braintree and ACH and that through a Stripe connected account or whatever to the venues, let's just process it on their EDC. Let's get the payment right into their bank account where it's just like a normal payment. So anyway, let's kind of dive in here. So when we think about transactions, we really kind of separate them into two categories at Space Foundation. The first is the card not present transaction. So these are all are pretty self-explanatory. Obviously, it makes sense that a card not present transaction is any transaction where the physical card is not being given at the time of a sale, right? Think of things such as over the phone, on the internet, mobile apps, like Uber or Lyft, Airbnb. And then a card present transaction is any time that you actually are physically giving the card where it's being swiped, maybe actually being inserted through the EMV with the chip card, or even the contactless payments. Those all are considered card present transactions, and those have really been what we've been using for the longest time. Um, really since the 70s when credit cards got big and everybody had one, um, that's what we've been used to. And the idea of a card not present transaction was, was a little sketchy at first. Um, and, and why does that matter? Well, it, there's two reasons why. Is the input method with pr payment processors is affected as far as how much they charge as a processing fee. And also the chargeback liability is the biggest thing. And we're seeing a lot of that with the EMV stuff for merchants that have not switched yet. So let's break it down a little bit further. Some of these I kind of already talked about. As far as card not present transactions, things such as online shopping, like Amazon, Jet.com, your reoccurring Netflix subscription, and any orders taken over the phone, and as more recent, the popular apps, such as like the Domino's app and, and Starbucks. Um, and, and most of these are using probably like a, a, you know, a payment process, such as like Braintree, owned by PayPal. Card present would be any transaction where your card is swiped on a POS terminal, contactless enabled terminals, or even a square reader. And I think it's safe to bet that everybody in here has some form of credit or debit card on them right now. And we both use both payment ways to pay. But how do we actually get to the card present type of currency? How do we go from where we had like this gold standard and we had these coins and shells? How do we end up to where we are today? And when I said I was going to give some history, I really did mean we were going to go pretty far back. And really from the beginning of time. Um, so money at the beginning really was all about the exchange of goods and services. Um, you know, various historians say that sometime around 9,000 BC, bartering started with livestock, plants, 
and common goods that held value to the person that needed them. I mean, some of these were really just literally needed for survival. Um, and then through the centuries, currency took some pretty interesting shapes, from cowrie shells to stones to the first ever currency, which was created by King Oetis in, in Witty, which is now part of Turkey. So that's the coin on the far right. And this coin actually is one of the first known struck minted coins and that's a big deal because that really kind of started the standardization of some type of currency or money that was, should be the same. Um, so these coins um, were based for money as well as for trade. And then in the 11th century, we started seeing the emergence of banknotes. Uh, the first known as pictured to the right is known as Jazu. I probably pronounced that wrong, but I think it's Jazu. Printed by the Song Dynasty, which is now in present day China. What happened was the central government at the time saw a huge economic advantage to printing money and been able to control it. And although, although gold and silver has been the most economic advantage to printing money and been able to control it, we actually had banknotes in the U.S. right around the 19th century. There was over 5,000 different banknotes that were issued. So there was a huge problem where you didn't know if this banknote could be accepted here or if this note could be accepted in this town. And right around then, that's when the U.S. Mint decided that, hey, we need to have one currency, one dollar bill, and that really happened right after the Civil War. So the National Banking Act in, in 1863 is where all of those bonds and currencies all had to be standardized, and then the dollar became the sole currency of the United States, and remains so today. So the concept of a valueless instrument to represent banking transactions dates back 5,000 years when ancient civilizations used to use clay tablets to conduct trade with other civilizations. During Western expansion, merchants would use charge coins and charge plates to extend credit to local farmers and ranchers, allowing them to forego paying their bills until their harvested crops were able to be sold and cattle was able to be traded. Around the 1900s, some department stores used um, charge coins for frequent customers, which visited and purchased items often, almost like VIPs. But the first credit card is credited to the diner's club card. And although its purchases were made on credit, Diner Club was technically a charge card, meaning the bill had to be paid in full at the end of the month. But by 1951, Diner Club had 20,000 card holders. This was followed by American Express, the company which originally started in 1850 as, as a competitor to the U.S. Postal Service, began issuing money orders in the 1880s, and then launched the first true plastic card in 1958. This was followed by major banks producing their own cards, such as the Bank of America card, which gave users the ability to have revolving credit and allowing their monthly balance to continue for a small interest change. Credit cards then exploded in the 1970s, introduced the, but all this introduced potential fraud, and the first real technical security innovation happened in 1960, when IBM added the magnetic strip that we still find in most cards today. And really from that point forward, we start to see the standardization of every aspect from the card, which is controlled by the International Organization for Standardization and the International Electrotechnical Commission. For starters, the size of the card is known as, as the 7810 ID1 standard. All cards have printed or embossed bank numbers, which is the sequence of digits at the beginning of the number that determine the bank to which a credit card belongs to. This is the first six digits for MasterCard and Visa cards. The next nine digits are individual account number, and the final digit is a validity check code. Credit card numbers were originally embossed to allow the transfer number to charge to slips. With the decline of paper slips, some credit cards are no longer embossed, and in fact, the card number is no longer on the front in some instances. But the biggest change is happening now in the shift to EMV. EMV, which stands for Europe MasterCard Visa, is a standard for card security, but although it's really not that new. The EMV standard was originally written in 1993 and 1994. The benefit of EMV all boils down to improved security against fraud by not just relying on the magnetic strip. But crypt cryptocurrent algorithms such as triple DES, RSA, and SHA. To provide authentication of the card to the processing terminal and the card's issuer's host system. This standard is known as the 78163. It defines the transmission protocol between chip cards and readers, and using this protocol data is exchange and application protocol data units, APD use. This comprises sending a command to a card, the card processing it, and sending a response. And we could do a whole separate presentation on the steps of EMV, authentication, the processing, and how that goes. But let's move on. So the U.S. really has been the last major market to, to adopt EMV. 
Um, the major car brands definitely saw this happening slowly, and what they did was they needed to kind of speed up the process. Um, so back in 2011, the car brand companies issued decrees that would then shift the liability for chargebacks and fraud transactions from the card issuers to the merchants, who chose not to be prepared to accept EMV-enabled transactions by the deadline of October 2015. Well, we saw how that went. <laughs> so when you hear anyone talk about EMV liability, 2015 shift, all that really means is who's liable. Let's say you and me, we go to a restaurant, right? And we have a $100 tab. At the end of the night, if we close out, all that's good. If they actually, we have a chip card and they actually swiped our card with the magnetic strip, we actually, even though they have a signed receipt, even though they have cameras, even though the owner even knows us, we could actually call our bank up and they would have to reissue the payment to us. So, so if you use a chip reader, fraud liability stays with the processor of the bank. And U.S. payment form estimates that 855 million chip cards have been issued of August 2017, but which is great. But that's only about 85% of active credit cards, according to the CPI card group. But not all merchant locations are EMV ready. Most figures say around only 58.5% are ready to process chip uh, payment cards. And what we've seen is most of these are the big box retails, such as Walmart and large chain stores. And not surprisingly, they made the EMV jump first. In some instances, merchants have bought the equipment and have it installed, but the credit card companies have not certified the equipment so it cannot be used. And there are 15 million locations estimated that need to be updated for chip card. And we find a majority of these are bars, restaurants, nightclubs. And most of these are owned not by some large companies, but are actually family owned. They're owned by private owners. So what they've been doing is they've really been outweighing the possible annual cost of chargebacks against the hardware upgrades. It's very expensive. The total combined cost for these upgrades for these locations is estimated to be $6.75 billion. So despite the reduction in fraud, EMV has left shoppers with a bitter experience with EMV, not knowing whether to swipe the card or insert it. And many people also complain about the charging time, which they were getting it down to about 2.5 seconds now, but really at the beginning it was like around five, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're staying in line. So what's next? So obviously we, we won't see credit cards disappearing anytime soon. And for quite some time, we've heard the term of the smart card. And, you know, a perfect example is a credit card like MasterCard released last year that uses a fingerprint sensor in the card. So using, you actually would use your fingerprint instead of the signature or the pin. And there's a company out there called SecureTouch that's taking this even further with behavioral anal analytics. So, for example, behavioral biometrics can analyze how someone uses their phone, learning the patterns to evolve the security, finger pressure, finger size, touch, coordinates, the angle they even hold the advice. There's actually 100 different physical attributes that they're actually, that are being measured. Um, so there's also the idea of not having one static number for your credit card. Imagine if your PAN number could actually rotate or change if let's say you felt like your card may be, um, you know, somebody may have actually got the number or wrote it down, you could actually just change it on a fly. And credit card issue of final is trying to solve the problem by allowing card to generate as, as many one-time user merchant locked card numbers as they want. This also can be done for a card security code. Um, there is a, the, the Uberta Technologies, which makes a majority of the chip cards in the U.S., um, has this thing what is called a motion code. So these cards have a mini screen on the back that changes the card verification value as often as 70 times per day. Or what about wearable items such as the ring or bracelet or keychain that can contain a chip to purchase items? Many experts seem to think that the next step in, wear, in, in weaning customers away from the physical plastic cards is innovation in mobile-based payments and using our phones as a mean of purchasing power. But let's first check about the novelty type internet transactions in the early 90s that really got us to the idea of being able to purchase a Starbucks on your phone. But, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, the history of card not present transactions is kind of sketchy. You know, it's not that, it's not that pretty. Um, and when you talk to various historians, a lot of people, you know, kind of, you know, when was the very first, you know, card not present transaction where a credit card was used? And really around the 1970s um, is when we started to see this idea of like mail orders, right? People ordering from purchase catalogs and, and maybe over the phone. Um, and that really was a big standard up until the 1990s. Um, so back then, you know, Visa and MasterCard, you would you'd give your number and then through the, or through the phone, and all those had to be manually entered 
by an operator, right? So whenever anything is manually entered, there's a chance for error. And at the time, the only way to really tell if a card was stolen or was invalid was they literally had like these phone books and they would issue them once a week. And it was like a subscription type plan and, and all the numbers were in numerical order. And what they would do is literally before they entered the card number, they would flip through this book and make sure that card is not on the do not charge list. So yeah, um, and that pretty much went unchanged for years um, and, until really the rise of the e-commerce transaction. And, and obviously all possible with the World Wide Web, especially when it became you know, available for commercial use in, in, in 1991. And then in 1994, we saw the very first financial institution, the Stanford Federal Credit Union, which offered online internet banking services. But you know, however, these first online systems weren't user friendly and required specialized knowledge of encryption and data transfer protocol. And as, as far as the first purchase made online, this is, there's a really actually big debate about this. And I've heard varying accounts, but uh, Pizza Hut swears that the very first item ever ordered online was in 1994 of a guy ordering a large cheese and mushroom pizza over the internet. And, but from what I have heard more so, is that the actual first transaction was through a thing called NetMarket, which was kind of like a very, very early Amazon. And a founder, his good buddy, actually purchased a Sting CD from that. And that's actually believed to be the very first e-commerce transaction with a credit card um, for public use. Um, but, you know, there was you know, these are all novelty type transactions. And, you know, it really wasn't even that convenient, honestly. And there was still a really big problem. And that was the merchant banks did not see much value in the internet. And they did little to help its growth. So obtaining a merchant account for the purpose of actually selling things on the internet was almost nearly impossible. Um, and that's pretty much true and to really to the, up to the middle of the 1990s. And then thankfully in 1995, Netflix communication created a way to ensure that shopping systems, online protocols, and certificates were gonna be able to make things safer, right? We've all heard of the SSL certificate, and that really just to all ensure the secure data transfer. So this really paved the way for giants like Amazon and eBay, which opened literally in the same year, and then payment uh, giant PayPal was founded in 1998. So you really almost can say that, you know, Amazon and eBay were just, they were right there at the perfect time, right? If, the, if, if Jeff Bezos and him tried doing this in 93, this, it wasn't gonna happen. But the fact that they were right there in that SSL certificate, really version two of the SSL certificate, because version one really was, didn't really do anything, um, that's, that was huge. So around the same time of like when PayPal was getting released in 98, we were really starting to see the cell phones becoming quite popular. And we started to see some really early emergence of, of mobile technology being used. Um, and one of the really first kind of mobile payments was using different types of texting services like M8, M8M. And an early example was in 1997, Coca-Cola introduced a few vending machines in larger cities where the customer can make a mobile purchase by texting a unique number to that vending machine and entering in their payment information. Ericsson and Telenor Mobile also developed mobile phones with the special ability to purchase movie tickets. You know, and for both of these, you literally had to enter the payment information for each transaction. And like I said, it's more of a novelty than it was convenience. And really, the technology with mobile phones is really not there yet. And there was no NFC, there was no mobile wallets, um, but everything really changed in 2007. We saw the release of the iOS and Android operating systems, but, you know, but more importantly, the emergence of mobile apps. And we started moving away from commerce payments to apps with dedicated credit card vaults that tokenize information. And you know, we could quickly make a transaction when called upon. Um, you know, this is also, you know, a bit, you know thanks for the, you know, the, pool, you know, the full stack payment things like you know, Braintree and Stripe, and, you know, by payment, you know, payment gateways where, you know, for instance, like Spreedly, you know, I can do 100 different payment gateways on multiple type of systems. So this was, this really caused an explosion of payment apps. Um, and really, the, the market has really hit rapid growth. Just in the last three years, it's been $180 billion processed through mobile payments. That's been tripling year on year. So what does the future of mobile payments look like? Well, you know, for some time now, we've begun to see a trend that people are embracing a cashless society. And you know, according to a study conducted by Business Insider, 40% of millennials surveyed would give up cash entirely if possible. And Europe is really making the biggest push to this. 
Um, countries like Sweden expect to be cashless within the next five years, and Denmark has pledged to get rid of cash entirely by 2030. Some countries like India are estimating that by 2020, that they are going to completely go cardless. But one thing for certain is they're going nowhere soon. And, but, you know, neither are our smartphones. And, you know, 95% 90, of all Americans own a smartphone, and about 77% of those are a, um, are a phone that's two years or newer. We've seen payment integrations in nearly every app category, from social networks like Snapchat and Facebook, to emerging digital wallets like Venmo and the Cash App, and even the gas station payment apps, such as the Exxon Speedy Pass. And although contact, contactless payments in re retail stores have estimated to rise around 90 million by 2020, payments by apps will, go to, will amount to a huge 318.8 3, billion for the same time period. You know, and at RadTab, we, that's where we really see the huge opportunity, is there's been multiple companies trying to get into the, pay, the mobile payments for restaurants. And we see that a lot with all of these fast food chains, right? Like the Chick-fil-A app or the McDonald's or Wendy's, you know, for the big chain stores where they've kind of created a white label product just for that exact store. But really the idea is, is creating a product that can work for numerous types of bars, restaurants, nightclubs, lounges, what have you. Um, and what's important about that is going back to the EMV thing. You know, the problem with EMV, it's not that nobody, want, nobody wants to actually insert their card, you know, vertically into the system. It's just that you don't even know which place is actually, it's being used at. I mean, you literally don't know until you're actually checking out. And, you know, that's a hardware issue. And I think really for innovation, we have to actually kind of get back, it, it kind of get past that. You know, how can we actually continue the innovation of payments without actually switching up too much of the existing hardware that's already in place? I mean, we saw how expensive that was where, you know, just $6.8 billion to actually upgrade just the POS systems to have the chip reader. That's not actually upgrading their software. That's not actually upgrading the terminals. That's literally just upgrading the small chip reader for, the, for that. So that really just wraps it up for me. Um, I hope you guys like history and learned a little bit of something. And, um, you know, really about where mobile payments and e-commerce is headed in the future. You know, I encourage everybody to add me on LinkedIn, um, ask me about RadTab. Um, I can show you guys the app. I love any unfiltered feedback, and uh, I really appreciate Spreely having me, and uh, thanks a bunch. Appreciate it.